we'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, Acorn TV. With Acorn TV, you can stream world-class television from Britain and beyond. Try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv and using my promo code ONCE. This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. It feels good to be back in the studio getting new episodes out for the month of April. This month, I'll be revisiting a series I did back in Season 1 of the podcast, Artful Crimes. In this series, I'll bring you true crime cases connected to the world of art and artists. In this episode, an up-and-coming artist who was connected to a high-profile politician becomes the victim of a violent crime. First, a little history to put this case into context. On November 22, 1963, our 35th President of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, was shot dead as he rode in a convertible and waved to crowds who came to see his motorcade drive through Dallas, Texas. 24-year-old Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested 45 minutes later after shooting and killing a police officer who'd stopped to question him. He denied shooting Kennedy, insisting he was a patsy. The next day, Oswald was shot and killed by Dallas resident Jack Ruby as he was escorted through the basement of the Dallas police headquarters to be transported to jail. Immediately after Kennedy's assassination, questions were raised about who was actually responsible for his murder. Was Oswald solely responsible, or was he a patsy, like he said, framed by powerful enemies of the president? Conspiracy theories around the assassination of JFK would proliferate and still continue until the present day. Less than a year later, a person close to Kennedy was also murdered in broad daylight. After her relationship with the slain president came to light, her name would forever be linked to his, and her murder would also become fodder for conspiracy theorists. Mary Pinchot Meyer's life and death was, and still is, overshadowed by President Kennedy's, but she lived an interesting and storied life of her own. Lost among her friendships with top-level government officials, prominent journalists, and CIA operatives, her life as an artist is often mentioned as an afterthought. But the truth is, she had been immersed in the art world for years and was just coming into her own as a contemporary artist. We return to the series Artful Crimes this month, as I share crimes that are connected to artists and the art world. This is Chapter 1, The Murder of Mary Pinchot Meyer. Mary Meyer put a few last touches on the canvas before deciding to take a break. She'd been working on this particular painting on a crisp October day and was feeling a bit melancholy. It was two days before her 44th birthday. In order to clear her head and lighten her mood, she donned a light hooded jacket and set off for her customary walk along the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal towpath, located just steps away from her Georgetown, Washington, D.C. studio. It was just after noon when Mary reached the end of the street and crossed through a densely wooded area, leading her to a path that followed the curve of the Potomac River. At about the same time, Henry Wiggins, a mechanic employed at a nearby service station, was called to the towpath area. He'd been sent to jumpstart a car with a dead battery. As he worked on the vehicle, he heard a cry from below him, coming from the towpath. Someone help me, he heard a woman's voice frantically calling. Running to a wall with a vantage point overlooking the trail, he heard two gunshots ring out. Peering down, Wiggins saw a man standing over the prone body of a woman. He would later describe him as standing about 5 foot 8 inches tall and weighing approximately 185 pounds. The man was black and was wearing a light-colored jacket, dark slacks, and a dark hat. Wiggins witnessed him place a dark object into his jacket pocket before he ran off, disappearing into the tree line and out of sight. Wiggins ran back to his truck and drove to the service station where he phoned the police. When police arrived, they found the body of Mary Pinchot Meyer lying near the river's edge. She had been shot twice, once in the head at close range. There was evidence that she struggled with her attacker. 
To investigators, it appeared that Mary had been grabbed from behind and had tried to escape after the first shot, leaving streaks of blood on a nearby tree. She'd then been dragged to the edge of the river, where she was shot a second time in the chest. Officers arrived quickly, and within minutes of the reported shooting, had worked to seal off all five exits from the towpath so no one could enter or exit. They fanned out and searched the area, under the assumption that Mary's murderer was trapped and hiding somewhere along the path. About 40 minutes after the search began, D.C. Police Detective John Warner encountered a man a quarter of a mile away from the murder scene. The man was walking casually, but appeared to be soaking wet. He was black and wearing dark slacks and a dark cap, which matched the witness description of the shooter. Warner stopped the man and questioned him. He said his name was Raymond Crump Jr. He explained that he had been fishing and had gotten wet when he lost his fishing pole and had gone into the river to retrieve it. Warner noted that Crump was not carrying a fishing pole or a tackle box. He asked Crump to point out where he'd been fishing. As Crump walked with the officer down the path to show him, the witness, Henry Wiggins, saw them approach. He called out, pointing to Crump, saying he was the man he saw standing over Mary's body. Crump was arrested on the spot. Mary Meyer's murder appeared to be an open and shut case. But when information about who she was, and more importantly, who she was closely associated with, later came to light, many would speculate that not all was as it appeared in this case. Today's presenting sponsor is Acorn TV, our favorite British streaming service providing world-class television from Britain and beyond. We invite all our listeners to support Acorn TV because your support allows us to keep our show free for you. Acorn TV is a commercial-free streaming service that's rooted in British television. From award-winning series across genres, including mysteries, dramas, comedies, and documentaries, Acorn TV has something you'll love. And you can even watch Acorn TV originals you won't find anywhere else. You can download the Acorn TV app or watch right from your computer. Because you love true crime stories, I highly recommend the series Manhunt. When a young exchange student is found murdered, Investigators, already working on two other murder cases involving young women, begin to suspect that they have a serial killer on their hands. Manhunt is based on the investigation to solve the real murder of Amélie Delagrange, a French student living in the UK who was found murdered in 2004. A true life story told in a compelling dramatization makes Manhunt a very bingeable series. You can watch Manhunt and thousands of hours of other great content rooted in British television from Acorn TV. Acorn TV costs a fraction of most streaming services at just $5.99 per month. From all of us at Once Upon a Crime, we thank Acorn TV for sponsoring today's show. Try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv and using my promo code once. That's A-C-O-R-N dot TV. And don't forget to use my code once to get your first 30 days free. If you're unhappy with your smile, you don't have to be any longer. Thousands of people have used Candid, the clear, comfortable, removable, and practically invisible aligners to help straighten their teeth. Now, they love their smile. Cameron S. from Nashville wanted straighter teeth for his wedding. Cameron says, My goal for my wedding was perfect teeth, and Candid got me there. But more than that, he adds, the confidence straighter teeth gave him transformed his life. If you want to feel more confident as you prepare to get back out in the world, you got to check out Candid. Your treatment is prescribed and monitored by a licensed orthodontist, and you'll get the same quality of care, but from the convenience of your own home. The average Candid treatment is just six months, and you'll start seeing results even sooner. Best of all, Candid costs thousands less than traditional braces. Become your best you. Start straightening your teeth today. Right now, you can save $75 on Candid Starter Kit by going to candidco.com once and use code ONCE. That's candidco.com slash ONCE to take advantage of this limited time offer to save $75 on your starter kit. Candidco.com slash ONCE and promo code ONCE. Mary Pincho Meyer was born on October 20th, 1920 in New York City. Her father was Amos Pincho a Yale graduate and veteran of the Spanish-American War. After earning a law license, he served as Deputy Assistant District Attorney for New York County and then as a lobbyist for President Theodore Roosevelt. 
He would later come to criticize the prevalence of corporate money in Republican politics and switch his allegiance to the Democratic Party. Pinchot's ideals would move further to the left, and he would become a proponent of the Progressive Party. Mary's mother, Ruth Pickering, was Amos's second wife. After graduating from Vassar College, Ruth moved to New York's Greenwich Village and lived in a communal home with other writers and artists. She wrote articles for left-leading publications like The Nation and The New Republic. Ruth was an early feminist who advocated for women's rights, like the right to vote and access to birth control. Amos and Ruth met when he began associating with leftist writers and thinkers and became a frequent guest of the communal house where she resided. Ruth and Amos found they had many ideals in common, despite their 20-year age difference. They married in 1919. In addition to Mary, the couple had a second daughter in 1924, Antoinette, who was called Tony. Amos also had two children from his first marriage, Rosamond and Gifford. The Pinchos had a Park Avenue apartment in the city and an estate in Milford, Pennsylvania, called Gray Towers. Mary and her sister were raised to become socialites, attending exclusive private schools on Manhattan's Upper East Side. At the age of 16, Mary attended a dance at Choate Hall, a private academy in Connecticut. There she met 18-year-old John F. Kennedy, a recent graduate of the school. Mary's life included horseback riding lessons and debutante balls before graduating from Vassar with a degree in journalism. Like her mother, Mary became a journalist, writing for the United Press and Mademoiselle. She later became editor of the Atlantic Monthly. In 1944, Mary met Cord Meyer, and they married the following year. Meyer graduated from Yale before serving as a Marine Corps lieutenant in World War II. He was injured during the Battle of Guam, losing his eye in a grenade attack, for which he received the Bronze Star. Meyer's twin brother, Quentin, was killed at Okinawa. Meyer was also a writer. His war dispatches had been published in the Atlantic. He had lost much in the war, including a brother. So when Meyer returned home, he joined the movement to work towards international peace between countries and served as special assistant for a delegate working to form the United Nations Organization. As the Cold War escalated, Meyer lost hope for world peace and became increasingly anti-communist. He shifted his focus to defeating communism and joined the CIA in 1951. While with the agency, Meyer is said to have played a role in assassination attempts on foreign leaders suspected of communist aims, wiretapping civilians, and using LSD experimentally on unsuspecting subjects. By 1951, Mary and Cord had three sons, Quentin, born in 1945, Michael in 1947, and Mark in 1950. After Meyer began working for the CIA, the family moved from Cambridge, Massachusetts to Washington, D.C. Mary ended her career in journalism after her second child was born. While in New York, she began taking art classes at the Art Students League. When the family relocated, Mary continued to study art at the Cambridge School of Design, focusing on painting. In D.C., the Meyers became well-known members of Georgetown Society, hobnobbing with politicians, government officials, and Beltway journalists. In the summer of 1954, the Myers welcomed new neighbors, newlyweds John F. Kennedy and his wife Jackie. The couples became friendly. Jackie and Mary were never close, but sometimes took walks together alone and with their spouses. Although Mary appeared to be living a wealthy and privileged life, it had also been touched by tragedy more than once. When Mary was still in high school, her half-sister Rosamond Pinchot took her own life at the age of 33. Rosamond, a stage actress and mother of two, had been recently separated from her husband of 10 years when she was found dead in her car of carbon monoxide poisoning. She left behind two suicide notes, the contents of which were never disclosed to the public. Mary's father Amos fell into a deep depression after his daughter's death. Rosamond was his eldest child and reportedly his favorite. In 1942, he cut his own wrists and nearly died. Never fully regaining his health, Amos Pinchot was confined to hospitals and sanatoriums for the remainder of his life. He died of pneumonia in 1944 at the age of 70, the year before Mary's wedding. Tragedy next struck one of Mary's children. In December 1956, nine-year-old Michael was playing near their home when he was struck by a car and killed. 
Mary and Cord had already begun to grow apart, and the trauma of losing a child eventually severed the relationship entirely. They filed for divorce in 1958, and Mary and her children moved to Georgetown. Mary began taking her art more seriously after her divorce. Beginning in 1959, she committed herself to painting in earnest. She also immersed herself in Washington, D.C.'s art community. Mary took a volunteer position at the Jefferson Place Gallery, a cooperative gallery opened in 1957 that was dedicated to exhibiting advanced art, color field art, lyrical abstraction, and other contemporary art. It was at the Jefferson Gallery that Mary met Kenneth Noland, a founding member associated with the Washington Color School, a group of six core abstract impressionist artists who primarily worked in color field painting, a form of non-representational art that explored ways of using large solid areas of paint. From 1957 to 1974, color school movement artists created works of vibrant solid colors in rings, circles, and lines. As the color school movement gained more attention, focus was shifted away from New York City's art scene for the first time, and Washington, D.C. artists earned national recognition. Mary and other women artists also began to receive praise from art critics. She had positioned herself at an important time and place to make her mark. Mary's art was influenced by Kenneth Nolan's work, who she became romantically involved with, as well as color field theory in general. Mary's paintings depicted blocky, colorful canvases that engaged the viewer on the materials and technique of the work rather than a pictorial representation. In her biography of Mary Pinchot Meyer, titled A Very Private Woman, author Nina Burley described her work this way. She painted one large circle with four hues of deep red, each one almost imperceptibly different from the other. In many of her canvases, she favored blue. Still within the formal color field style, she experimented with non-geometric curving yin and yang shapes. Mary had been part of the Washington, D.C. scene for years and had influential friends in both the political and art worlds. She was close friends with sculptor Anne Truitt, with whom she had shared an artist's studio. Anne was married to journalist James Truitt, who worked for both Life and Time magazines, as well as Art News. Mary's sister Tony was married to Ben Bradley, one of the most notable journalists in the U.S. after World War II. He served as both managing editor and executive editor of the Washington Post, rising to prominence after publishing the Pentagon Papers, which detailed for the first time the extent of the U.S. government's actions during the Vietnam War. The Post reported on information hidden from the American public and lied about to Congress by the Johnson administration. Bradley was also editor of the Post when two reporters, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, broke the story about the 1972 break-in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate office building, a scandal that would bring down the Nixon presidency. Bradley had been friends with JFK since the 1950s when Kennedy was a senator. They lived in the same neighborhood before he was elected president and ran in the same circles. Through her sister Tony and her brother-in-law Ben, Mary reconnected with Kennedy. Jack Kennedy, as he was more casually addressed, had been attracted to Mary Meyer since their paths first crossed as neighbors in the mid-1950s. Mary was a beautiful blonde, but more importantly, she was a fascinating woman. She held strong opinions on a number of subjects, from art to politics to the state of the world. Her life as an artist had opened up another world entirely from the one she had shared with Cord. As the wife of a CIA agent, she had effortlessly rubbed elbows with government officials, CIA operatives, and D.C.'s social set. As an artist, she immersed herself in a more bohemian lifestyle. The 1960s ushered in a new era of experimentation. Mary was ready to shed off the more staid and buttoned-up persona she had been accustomed to as a D.C. wife and mother and return to her roots as the daughter of a feminist mother and progressive father. Through her relationship with Kenneth Noland and other artists, Mary was introduced to another lifestyle. She frequented jazz clubs and learned to smoke marijuana. She and Noland engaged in something called Rishian therapy. Through therapeutic bodywork and other methods, they were guided to, quote, let go of inhibitions and embrace sexual openness. She also became acquainted with Timothy Leary, a clinical psychologist at Harvard University, who was the leading advocate of the use of psychedelic drugs. Leary saw drugs like LSD as a therapeutic tool, 
believing that mind-expanding drugs could help people overcome a number of psychiatric issues if they were monitored and safely guided through the experience by a professional such as himself. Mary Meyer's socialite-slash-bohemian artist lifestyle excited Jack Kennedy, making her even more desirable in his eyes. He pursued Mary relentlessly for some time. Kennedy was jealous of her relationship with Ken Nolan, saying, What does Nolan have that I don't? It's unknown exactly when Mary and Jack Kennedy began a relationship, but from the time he entered the White House as president in 1961 through 1963 when he was killed, White House logbooks record Mary visiting JFK over 30 times. Most of her visits occurred when his wife, Jacqueline Kennedy, was away. Her first visit was recorded in October 1961. Some who've claimed to have knowledge of Mary's affair with the president say that he was more than a little smitten with her. Their connection was not just physical, but Kennedy also respected her point of view and listened to her opinions. Some reports claim that Mary influenced Kennedy with her pacifist views on nuclear disarmament and rapprochement with Cuba, although this is unconfirmed. Timothy Leary would also later claim that Mary visited him at Harvard, asking him to teach her how to guide another person's experience with LSD. Leary offered to mentor her friend, but she told him this was not possible as it was a, quote, very influential person who needed to remain anonymous. Some believe that Mary's friend who wanted to experiment with the drug was President Kennedy. There are several accounts by others of Jack Kennedy smoking marijuana with Mary. Whether either of these rumors are true is a question for the ages. What is known for certain, however, is that Kennedy was still imploring Mary to meet him for a rendezvous even up until his final days. A month before his assassination, he wrote her a letter that was never sent, but remained in the possession of his personal secretary, Evelyn Lincoln. The letter suggests that Mary had stopped seeing Kennedy, and he was trying to convince her to meet him once more. It reads, quote, Why don't you leave suburbia for once? Come and see me, either here or at the Cape next week, or in Boston on the 19th. I know it is unwise, irrational, and that you may hate it. On the other hand, you may not, and I will love it. You say that it's good for me to not get what I want. After all these years, you should give me a more loving answer than that. Why don't you just say yes, unquote. The letter, written on White House stationery, is simply signed with the letter J. Like the country as a whole, after Kennedy's assassination, Mary Pinchot Meyer grieved deeply. She threw herself even more into her painting, completing several works. However, her art was not often shown. In late 1963, she was given a solo exhibition at the Jefferson Place Gallery. The exhibition was reviewed favorably in the Washington Post, but Mary's accomplishment was bittersweet, as it came out two days after Kennedy's death. In 1964, she received the honor of having her work included in an international exhibition, organized by the Pan American Union. But by the time the exhibit opened in Buenos Aires, Mary Pincho Meyer would be found lying dead on a Washington, D.C. towpath. Raymond Crump Jr. had been arrested for the murder of Mary Pincho Meyer after being identified by a witness, Henry Wiggins, who claimed to see him standing over Mary's body. A white jacket matching the description of the assailants was found lying near the shoreline. It fit Crump perfectly. Crump's wife also identified the jacket as similar to one Crump owned. A second witness came forward the day after the murder. Army Lieutenant William L. Mitchell told investigators that he saw a black man trailing a white woman who he believed was Mary. He described the man the same as Wiggins had, wearing a light-colored windbreaker-type jacket, dark slacks, and a peaked golf hat. He further described the suspect as similar in height as himself. Lieutenant Mitchell stood 5 foot 8 inches tall. With two eyewitness statements that corroborated one another and matched the description of their suspect in custody, Crump was indicted for murder without a preliminary hearing. The gun used to kill Mary was never found. The alibi that Crump had given police when he was discovered near the towpath soaking wet, that he was fishing and had lost his pole, was contradicted by Crump's neighbor. He told police that he'd watched Crump leave his house that morning wearing a white windbreaker but carrying no pole or fishing tackle. Crump also didn't produce a tackle box to verify his story. 
However, there were some holes in the investigator's case. There was nothing linking Crump to the type of weapon used to commit the murder. Mary, after being shot in the head, had bled profusely, but there was no blood on Crump or his clothing. Crump retained Dovey Johnson Roundtree as his defense counsel. Roundtree was a formidable opponent in any courtroom. Born in Charlotte, North Carolina in 1914, she would graduate from Spelman College and enter Howard University School of Law on the GI Bill. She was one of 40 African-American women chosen to serve as officers in the newly formed Women's Army Auxiliary Corps during World War II. She became a well-known figure in the fight for African-American civil rights, winning a case against the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1955, the first bus desegregation case brought before the commission. Roundtree opened a law practice in Washington, D.C. with a partner, Julius Robertson. They sought justice for their black clients in civil and criminal matters when many U.S. courtrooms were still segregated. When Ray Crump was charged with the murder of Mary Pinchot Meyer in 1964, Roundtree took on his case for the fee of $1. When the murder trial commenced, federal prosecutors called 27 witnesses and entered over 50 exhibits to prove their largely circumstantial case against Crump. Roundtree, in contrast, called only three witnesses and entered just a single exhibit. Her defense of Crump consisted of just two main arguments. She first called into question the eyewitness testimony. Both Henry Wiggins and Lieutenant Mitchell had described Mary's assailant as standing 5 foot 8 inches tall and weighing about 185 pounds. Crump, she pointed out, was only 5 foot 3. He also weighed 50 pounds less than the man the witnesses claimed to have seen that day. The defense also got Wiggins to admit that he'd only glimpsed the man for a moment and could not with 100% certainty say it was Crump. Mitchell also was not able to positively identify the man he saw as Crump. Furthermore, Roundtree produced a map of the area to refute the claim that all the exits to the towpath had been sealed off by police. On the stand, officers were forced to admit that other exits had been available and may have been used by the killer to make his getaway. After a short 20-minute closing argument, the defense rested, and the case went to the jury on July 29, 1965. They deliberated for 11 hours, first sending word to the judge that they were deadlocked 8 to 4. They were instructed to continue deliberations and try to reach a verdict. They did, and returned one of not guilty. Crump was acquitted of all charges. So if we're to agree that Crump was not Mary's killer, then who was? The answer to that question would become hotly debated once certain other facts about the case came to light. The evening after the murder, two calls were placed to Mary's sister Tony and her husband Ben Bradley. The first one came from Pierre Salinger in Paris. Salinger had been Kennedy's press secretary. He called Bradley to express his condolences about Mary's death. Bradley was surprised by this call since he was not aware that Salinger and Mary were acquainted. This would later indicate to Bradley and others that Mary and the president had been more closely connected than anyone had realized. The second was from Anne Truitt, Mary's friend and studio partner, who was in Japan at the time she heard about her friend's murder. Anne was looking for James Angleton, the CIA's counterintelligence chief. Anne informed Mary's sister Tony, her husband Bill, and James Angleton of the existence of Mary's private diary. Anne revealed that she had been instructed by Mary that, should anything ever happen to her, she wanted Anne to retrieve her diary and have it destroyed. According to Ben Bradley's 1995 memoir titled A Good Life, Truett told them that the diary contained details about Mary's affair with the president during the last two years of his life. The group agreed to keep the diary hidden. The following day, Tony and Bradley went to Mary's studio to break into it and take possession of the diary. When they arrived, James Angleton was already there, picking the lock with special tools. Some versions of the story say that Angleton had not been told about the existence of the diary by Anne Truitt, but by his wife, Cecily, who was also a close friend of Mary's. In this version, Mary had given instructions to both Anne and Cecily to retrieve the diary upon her death or incapacitation in order to keep her affair with Kennedy a secret. According to Bradley, Tony eventually found the diary in her sister's studio. The diary, Bradley claims, contained a short section where Mary discusses an affair with an unnamed person that he said could easily be guessed 
to be JFK. Tony then gave the diary to Jesse Angleton, who was supposed to burn it at CIA headquarters. Why there? Who knows? Tony allegedly later discovered that he had not burned the diary. She retrieved it and burned it herself, forever closing the door on any secrets that might still be discovered about Mary's relationship with Kennedy. When the story about the hidden diary was revealed to the public years later, the mysterious death of Mary Pinchot Meyer became the focus of conspiracy theories. The most prominent of these theories was that Mary had been killed by the CIA as part of a conspiracy involving the assassination of JFK, which posed the question, why else would the CIA's counterintelligence chief be involved in breaking and entering to retrieve the diary? Some speculated that Kennedy may have shared classified information with Mary during their trysts, and this knowledge made her a target of the CIA. Also, because some had come to believe there was still a question about who had killed Kennedy and for what reason, the next leap made by conspiracy theorists was that Mary had inside information about the assassination and or cover-up. There were also arguments made against her murder having been orchestrated by the CIA. Wiggins heard Mary cry out for help. An assassin trained by the CIA would be able to sneak up on a target and eliminate them without giving them time to react, one argument states. And my question would be, why would a professional choose to carry out this type of a mission in broad daylight and in a populated area? So, what is the most likely truth? Mary Pinchot Meyer's murder, perhaps, can best be understood by the theory of Occam's razor, which states that the simplest explanation is usually the right one. In my opinion, the simplest explanation is that Ray Crump was the man who attacked and killed Mary on the towpath that October afternoon in 1964. We know that eyewitness testimony is often faulty, and accounts can vary widely. However, while both witnesses got the height and weight of the perpetrator incorrect, the clothing he was wearing was described almost exactly by both men. I'd say that that detail is much easier to describe than the height or weight of a person. I would be terrible at guessing anyone's weight and could probably only give a very loose guess at any person's height, unless they were standing beside me for comparison. Crump's attorney pointed out that no blood was found on Crump when he was found. Investigators believe the shooter was holding her near him when he fired the first shot, and his attorney argued that at such close range, blood should have been found on his clothing or body. But did we forget that he was soaking wet from jumping into the river when the officer encountered him? Doesn't it make sense that he did this to wash off any evidence, including blood? No weapon was found, but Crump could have ditched it in a million places where it could be difficult or even impossible to find, including in the river. The most likely scenario is that Mary was taken from behind and threatened with the gun. His plan was probably to drag her into the woods to commit robbery or rape. One detail I didn't mention earlier was that when Crump was found, his pants were open at the zipper. When asked to explain this upon his arrest, he said that the police officer had done it while searching him. But when his weapon did not deter Mary from crying out for help, he panicked and shot her. After his acquittal on the murder charge, Ray Crump was convicted for several violent crimes, including arson and the rape of a 13-year-old. His ex-wife told Mary's biographer, Nina Burley, that she'd gone into hiding because she was afraid of him. Crump had attacked her with a knife, she said, leaving a scar. She also said that her husband would fall into strange and violent fugue states that often came without warning. If true, could Crump have been experiencing one of these fugue states when he attacked Mary? If Mary's murder was the work of a random violent attack, how then do we explain the efforts taken by several people to destroy Mary's diary, including a high-ranking CIA officer? The simplest explanation is that these people were all friends of Mary, who were carrying out her wishes to keep her private life private. They were also Americans who had just lost their president and may have wanted to preserve his reputation. Or perhaps they wished to save his wife, Jacqueline Kennedy, from the pain and embarrassment of such a secret being revealed. The last letter Kennedy wrote to Mary Pinchot Meyer but never mailed was put up for auction in 2016. It sold for just under $89,000. Most of Mary Pinchot Meyer's paintings are not on public view. 
if they still exist, they are most likely in the possession of private owners. Only one of them can be viewed by the public. Her best-known work, titled Half Light, hangs in the Smithsonian American Art Museum. That will do it for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. But I'll be back next week with another art-related crime, and it is a doozy. Make sure you follow or subscribe to Once Upon a Crime in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss an episode. Don't forget, if you'd like to get ad-free episodes of Once Upon a Crime, you can do so in a couple of different ways. You can join our Patreon, and for as little as $2 per month, get ad-free episodes and listen to them before anyone else. Go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime to find out more and join. If you're a Stitcher Premium member, go to the app, look for Once Upon a Crime, and hit follow. You'll then get every episode of Once Upon a Crime ad-free. If you're not a member, you can get your first month free when you sign up by using our discount code Once Upon a Crime. You'll then have access to not only this podcast, but scores of others ad-free, including True Crime Garage, My Favorite Murder, and Generation Y. I've included all the links in the show notes. Thanks. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Our administrative and research assistant is Lorena Garcia, and original music is by Aaron Michael Goldberg. Until next time, be good to one another. Once again, we'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, Acorn TV. With Acorn TV, you can stream world-class television from Britain and beyond. Try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv and using my promo code once. Acorn TV, where mystery is mesmerizing and drama addictive. New and exclusive series streaming commercial free. 